from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And uh, welcome to our first noontime lecture of the 2013 year in the beautiful Woodrow Wilson room here at the library. Um, I'll take a moment to let you know that this afternoon's program is being webcast um, by the library for future broadcast on the library's website and the Kluge Center homepage. Uh, today's lecture is presented by the John W. Kluge Center in conjunction with the library's Poetry and Literature Center. The John W. Kluge Center is a vibrant scholars center on Capitol Hill that brings together scholars and researchers from around the world to stimulate and energize one another, to distill wisdom from the library's rich resources, and to interact with policymakers and the public. The center offers opportunities for senior scholars and postdoctoral fellows to do research in the Library of Congress collections, as well as pre-doctoral fellows. We also offer free public lectures, conferences, symposia, and other programs, and administer the Kluge Prize, uh, which recognizes a lifetime achievement in the fields of humanistic and social science studies. So for more information about the Kluge Center, please visit our website, www.loc.gov slash Kluge, K-L-U-G-E. And we have an RSS email list. Uh, there's a pad there that you can sign up for to get email notifications about future events. And as well, you can sign up uh, for our RSS on the library's homepage. Um, I also encourage you to visit loc.gov poetry to learn more about the Poetry and Literature Center and their upcoming programming, including a Civil War reading by Poet Laureate Natasha Trethewey, which will happen next Wednesday, January 30th at noon here at the library. Today's lecture is titled The Afterlives of Specimens, Science and Mourning in Whitman's America. Our speaker is Lindsay Tuggle. Lindsay is now concluding her tenure as a Kluge Fellow here at the John W. Kluge Center. She has a PhD in English Literary Studies from the University of Sydney, where she teaches English Literary Studies. And as a Kluge Fellow, she has been researching and writing her book, The Afterlives of Specimens, Science and Mourning in Whitman's America. Lindsay's research has been published in academic journals, Invisible Culture and The Space Between, Literature and Culture, 1914 to 1945. And her work has also been included in several edited collections, including Rereading De Derrida, Perspectives on Mourning and Its Hospitalities, Poetry Criticism, and Remaking Literary History. So without further ado, please welcome Lindsay Tuggle. Thank you so much, and thanks to everyone for coming. This is really exciting. Before I start in earnest, I just have a few people that I'm indebted to that I want to acknowledge. Um, I want to begin with everyone at the Kluge Center, especially Carolyn Brown, Mary Lou Reeker, Travis Hensley, and Jason Steinhauer. Um, I'd also like to thank Robert Hicks, the curator of the Motor Museum in Philadelphia. Eric Boyle and Brian Spatola at the National Museum of Health and Medicine, uh, Carol Johnson in the Photography Division here at the Library, Alice Burney in the Manuscript Division for all of her help with the Whitman material, um, Thomas Mann and all of the reference librarians, and everyone at the Washington Whitman Society for a delightful tour of Civil War era Fredericksburg, which we will visit momentarily. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge my fellow fellows and close friends, Stephanie Schaefer and Ilaria Andrioli. Um, and finally, the inevitable disclaimer, um, the material that I'll be presenting today is an excerpt from the second chapter of my book, and I truly hope that it has not lost too much coherence in the dissection, all puns intended. Um, it's very much a work in progress, and I look forward to hearing your feedback. So we begin. In December 1862, the poet Walt Whitman and the surgeon John Brenton arrived separately at Falmouth, Virginia in the aftermath of the Battle of Fredericksburg. Whitman had traveled from Brooklyn in search of his brother George, who was listed as a casualty. 
Brinton scavenged the field hospital's medical waste in search of specimens for the Army Medical Museum. Whitman found George alive and relatively unscathed. A shell fragment had grazed his cheek, but he suffered no lasting damage. The poet remained at camp for two weeks, crystallizing the devotion to wounded soldiers that would dominate his life for the duration of the war and well beyond. Whitman spent the remaining war years as a constant presence at the bedsides of soldiers in the Washington hospitals to the detriment of his own health. Irrevocably altered by these encounters with wounded and dying men, he endeavored to preserve their, quote, spiritual character within his poetry and prose. The presence of specimens endures throughout Whitman's postbellum work. He even titled his autobiography, which was largely devoted to the war, Specimen Days. Yet Whitman's scholarship has yet to produce a sustained interrogation of the specimen as material remains of the dying soldier. Whitman offers a unique vantage from which to study Civil War legacies of death, disease, and amputation through discourses of mourning, trauma, and sexuality. The specimen body occupies the space between science and sentiment, the historical moment of convergence at which the human cadaver is both lost love object and subject of anatomical violence. Today I want to examine previously unrecognized symmetries between Whitman's war texts and those of John Brinton, founding curator of the Army Medical Museum. The two men led parallel lives during the war. Through the entwined narratives of Whitman's memoranda during the war and the personal memoirs of John H. Brinton, this chapter of my book traces a cultural transformation in the treatment of the human body and its dissected parts. As a discourse on the psychosomatic resonance of trauma, Whitman's memoranda occupies a position of startling contemporary relevance, not only to literary representations of history, but issues of legacy, mourning, and the inherent unknowability of the casualties of war. Whitman's convalescent soldiers are frequently described as specimens, a term that fuses an interest in classification with an intimate form of observation. Whitman describes these soldiers as emblems of democracy. Quote, the main interest of the war I found in these specimens, in the ambulance, the hospital, and even the dead on the field, in the millions of American men, north and south, embodied in the armies, and especially the one-third or one-fourth of their number stricken by wounds or disease. Whitman's specimens serve a symbolic function that is both intimate and abstract. As an incarnation of the fractured union and the fragmented body, they represent, quote, phantoms of countless lost soldiers. Whitman remained haunted by the anonymous dead, those who lay nameless in mass graves or remained where they fell, unburied and unknown. Their deaths eclipse all other consequences as though the entire war were waged upon the specimen as emblem of the democratic body. In the absence of burial for so many fallen soldiers, Whitman offers an alternative method for mourning the dead. The specimen is interred within the book, resurrected whenever its pages are opened. Quote, I can never turn their tiny leaves without the actual army sights and hot emotions of the time rushing like a river in full tide through me. Each line, each scrawl, each memorandum has its history. Out of them arise active and breathing forms. They summon up, even in this silent and vacant room as I write, not the sinewy regiments and brigades, but the countless phantoms of those who fell and were hastily buried by in the battle pits, or whose dust and bones have since been removed to the national cemeteries. Whitman's response to these tiny leaves goes beyond the provocation of a traumatic flashback. Living beings arise from the pages bringing with them the actual sights and emotions of the time. The book acts as a medium for a collective haunting, home to countless phantoms whose dust and bones were long since removed to national cemeteries. The exhumation and reburial of these bodies signifies the diasporic afterlives of Civil War specimens. Whitman inhabited a landscape of diverse mourning cultures, negotiating elaborate rituals between the living and the dead. Annabellum anatomists, elegists, spiritualists, and mourners shared a collective fascination with the corpse that dominated the 19th century. 
Curiosity about the consequences of battle saw bodies displayed for public consumption long after death and dismemberment. During the war, the chronic shortage of cadavers available for anatomical dissection was temporarily suspended. Seemingly overnight, battlefield carnage transformed human bodies from rare commodities, usually obtained illegally, into abundant specimens readily available for the taking. The corpses of soldiers were appropriated by surgeons, embalmers, curators, and photographers. Their bodies and limbs manipulated to suit the particular purposes of the collector's context. Photographers such as Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner published wildly popular collections of battlefield scenes, while thousands viewed the specimens on display at the new Army Medical Museum. John Hill Brenton, a prominent Philadelphia surgeon, began his military service in August 1861 when he volunteered as a brigade surgeon. Within a year of enlisting, he was reassigned to the Surgeon General's office, where his primary duty was to prepare the surgical history of the rebellion. On August 1st, 1862, Brenton was directed by Surgeon General William Hammond to establish a museum devoted to, quote, specimens of morbid anatomy. This was the beginning of an anatomical collection that would incorporate thousands of Civil War remains, many of which are still on display at the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Brenton found himself entrenched in, quote, a ghoul-like duty, responsible for the procurement of anatomical artifacts, quote, portraying the results of wounds, operations, or peculiar amputations. Throughout the war, he traveled to hospitals and battlefields in search of specimens, sometimes exhuming bodies from their graves in order to obtain the desired part. Brenton regarded the curatorship as his greatest professional achievement. Quote, my whole heart was in the museum. By it, the results of the surgery of this war would be preserved for all time. Brenton's rhetoric here reflects a culture of preservation that began during the war and flourished in the aftermath of Lincoln's assassination. The museum infused dissected matter with national significance in an effort to counter the dismemberment of the Union. The preservation of the body, by whatever means necessary, became of paramount importance during the Civil War. In the space of a few decades, Anatomical dissection evolved from a posthumous punishment enacted on the bodies of stolen, executed, or unclaimed cadavers to an element of preservationist technology worthy of the presidential courts. The extended public display of Lincoln's body was made possible by recent innovations in embalming, which was often practiced on the bodies of unknown soldiers. The human remnants of warfare displayed at the museum paved the way for the publication of details of Lincoln's cranial autopsy, a phenomenon that would have been unthinkable even a decade earlier. Bone fragments from Lincoln's skull were incorporated into the museum, alongside other relics such as the surgeon's bloody cuffs. Lincoln eventually joined the ranks of specimens whose case histories were detailed in the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. The museum was relocated to Ford's Theater in 1867, securing Lincoln's status as America's most sacred democratic specimen. In the opening pages of his memoir, Brenton frames the crisis of the Union in terms of preservation. Quote, the problem was how to preserve the unity and majesty of the nation, how soonest to trample out the doctrines of disintegration and secession. The surgeon's preservation compulsion betrays not only an anatomical agenda, but also a patriotic impulse. The disintegration of the Union led to Southern secession, just as de decay of the democratic body led to amputation. By collecting a series of, quote, mutilated limbs, Brenton created a coherent medical narrative of the war, reflecting a nation that contained the rejected members of its citizens. The museum perpetuated the unionist ideology that decay of the wounded democratic body could be arrested, that amputation of the secessionist states was not the only option. Amputation was perhaps the Civil War's most gruesome medical legacy. The limbs of our friends and countrymen, wrote physician Oliver Wendell Holmes, are part of the melancholy harvest which war is sweeping down. That violent reaping severed the extremities of some 60,000 soldiers. Almost two-thirds of Civil War deaths resulted from infection and disease. 
The hospital wards were, in their way, every bit as dangerous as the killing fields. Absent any medical understanding of sepsis or germ theory, the cure was often as deadly as the cause. Arriving in Falmouth on December 19th, Whitman was immediately confronted with the corporeal detritus of war. The poet recorded his horror at the terrible spectacle of the dead and living burial pits surrounding the camp. Quote, at the foot of a tree within 10 yards of the front of the house, I noticed a heap of amputated feet, legs, arms, hands, a full load for one horse cart. This image describes the temporary field hospital at Lacey House, where surgeons dropped severed limbs from two large windows near the makeshift operating tables. The limbs formed a mound at the base of a catalpa tree below and were eventually removed for burial in mass graves. Brenton may have sifted through this same pile in search of specimens. By the time Whitman entered the war scene, the curator was already an established presence in the hospital, having arrived several days earlier. Brenton devoted an entire chapter of his memoir to his experiences at Fredericksburg. While both men were compelled to care for the wounded, Brenton also searched the surgical debris to preserve for the museum, quote, the mutilated limbs that without intervention were usually buried in heaps. Brenton was aware of the garish spectacle he presented, but described the nationalistic fervor of his endeavors as infectious. Quote, many and many a putrid heap have I dug out of trenches where they had been buried in the supposition of everlasting rest, and ghoul-like work have I done amid surrounding gatherings of wandering surgeons, but all saw that I was in earnest and my example was infectious. Brenton appropriates the viral rhetoric of infection to describe the patriotic contagion of his ghoul-like work. As a medical resurrectionist, he subverted the everlasting rest of burial in favor of a public afterlife in the museum. The spectacle of discarded limbs outside Lacey House endured as a traumatic afterimage in Whitman's memory. In a letter to his mother, he described this scene of dismemberment as, quote, one of the first things that met my eyes in camp. In his field diary from Fredericksburg, Whitman again reflected on the sight at Lacey House. Quote, human fragments, cut, bloody, black and blue, swelled and sickening, in the garden near a row of graves. As a visual legacy, the afterimage returns unbidden, an optical ghost that appears long after the original exposure has ended. The resonance of this initial encounter foreshadows Whitman's fascination with amputation as a signifier of the wound's erotic vacancy and his continued reverence toward war's casualties and their discarded parts. Yet Whitman resists the temptation to sentimentalize what was, in effect, the necessary disposal of medical waste in a war triage setting. Describing the conditions in Lacey House, he recognized the chaos in which the surgeons worked. Quote, the large mansion is quite crowded upstairs and down, everything impromptu, no system, but I have no doubt the best that can be done. All wounds pretty bad, the men in their old clothes, unclean and bloody. While he does not question the doctor's competence, Whitman is shaken by the seemingly casual abandonment of soldiers' lives and limbs. Reflecting on the perils of, quote, ignorant physicians, Brinton recalled a similarly bloody environment at Fort Donaldson. After hearing accounts of a great surgeon operating from a temporary hospital in a little country house, he set out to observe the man at work. Quote, I found blood-stained footmarks on the crooked stairs and in the second story room, amputated arms and legs seemed almost to litter the floor. Beneath the operating table was a pool of blood, the operator was smeared with it, and the surroundings were ghastly beyond all limits of surgical proprietary. Even in the era before the pathogenic theory of medicine, Brenton was instinctually repelled by the absence of hygiene. His fury toward inept doctors was echoed on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. Confederate surgeon Julian John Chisholm deplored the threat of the scalpel and overzealous hands. Quote, the limbs of soldiers were in as much danger from the ardor of young surgeons as the missiles of the enemy. While the wounded languished in camp hospitals around Fredericksburg, Whitman began the bedside ministrations that would consume him for the remainder of the war. Quote, the wounded lying on the ground, lucky if their blankets are spread on layers of pine or hemlock twigs or small leaves. I go around from one case to another. I do not see that I do much good to these wounded and dying, but I cannot leave them. 
Once in a while, some youngster holds on to me convulsively. I do what I can for him, sit near him for hours if he wishes it. Whitman's description of the soldier's convulsive embrace demonstrates the permanence of his ties to the men he attended. However immaterial he perceives his presence to be, he is incapable of leaving them behind. Memoranda during the war charts Whitman's vast alteration through the hospitality of merging with another's wound. From his earliest war entries, Whitman insists that the body need not be whole or even alive in order to be adored. Okay. When he departed Falmouth, Whitman accompanied a convoy of wounded soldiers bound for the Washington hospitals. They traveled by rail to Aquia Creek, Virginia, where they transferred to a government steamship. Whitman recorded the casualties of the arduous passage. Quote, on the boat I had my hands full. One poor fellow died going up. Two weeks earlier, Brenton and his assistant curator, William Moss, made arrangements for the transportation of their museum relics. On December 15th, they were ambushed while smuggling, quote, an immense number of surgical specimens on the backs of one or two very black Negroes. After surviving Confederate gunfire with their lives and specimens intact, Moss exclaimed, quote, what a blessed escape, for what a wretched ending it would have been to one's life to have been swept into the river on an ignominious retreat, holding on to a bag of bones. Brenton's account of their escape demonstrates the totality of the Union's appropriation according to military and racial hierarchies. He ignores the earlier admission that these specimens were not actually carried by the surgeons themselves. African-American laborers were forced to transmit immense quantities of specimens across enemy lines. Lamenting how wretched it would have been to die in retreat, clutching his bag of bones, Moss assumes possession of the black hands that held the remains, as though they were, by extension, his own. In another rhetorical twist, he adopts the wrong body part, having initially specified that the bones were carried on the men's backs, a position that links them again with slavery. Even the number of black bodies is uncertain. When assuming credit for their labor, Brenton transfers the specimens from the backs of black men to the hands of white surgeons, the site of their professional power. While Brenton continued his efforts to expand the museum's collections in Washington, Whitman established residency at the Capitol as a self-appointed soldier's missionary. The poet devoted his considerable energies to the soldiers, tending by his own estimation 80 to 100,000 of the wounded as sustainer of spirit and body. That's a quote. Whitman divided his rounds between Armory Square, Campbell Hospital, Judiciary Square, and the Patent Office wards. From October 1861 until March 1863, the Patent Office relinquished a large wing for the care of wounded soldiers. This granite structure on the corner of 7th and F Street, Streets was designed as, quote, a temple to the industrial arts, modeled after the Parthenon. Whitman admired its Doric facade, describing it as, quote, that noblest of Washington buildings. The galleries displayed models submitted by inventors along with their patent applications and provided exhibition space for other artifacts, including natural history specimens from Charles Wilkes exploring expedition. Whitman was mesmerized by the, quote, immense apartments filled with high and ponderous glass cases, crowded with models in miniature of every kind of utensil, machine, or invention it ever entered the mind of man to conceive, and with curiosities. During the war, the domed halls contained an even stranger collection. The most severe casualties from Second Bull Run, Antietam, and Fredericksburg were brought here. Soldiers suffering from infected wounds, failed amputations, fevers, pneumonia, and dysentery were all housed in one large ward. The sight of convalescent beds between the illuminated display cases created an eerie spectacle. Quote, between these, lateral case, these cases are lateral openings, perhaps eight feet wide and quite deep, and in these were placed the sick. Many of them were very bad cases, wounds and amputations. It was indeed a curious sight at night when all lit up. The glass cases, the beds, the forms lying there, the gallery above and the marble pavement underfoot, the suffering and the fortitude to bear it in various degrees. Sometimes a poor fellow dying with emaciated face and glassy eye, 
the nurse by his side, the doctor also, but no friend, no relative. Such were the sights but lately in the patent office. This curious scene, perhaps more than any other, haunted Whitman's hospital prose. Traces of these human specimens recur as ghostly imprints throughout the Whitman canon. Their bodies recall the industrial models and zoological specimens that surrounded them and preceded their occupation of the space. Their convalescence within the galleries foreshadows their potential afterlives, dismembered and stripped of flesh in the Army Medical Museum. Like the bone relics Brinton exhibited, these living soldiers are already anonymous, strangers with no friend, no relative to witness their final hours. This anonymity is central to their spectral magnetism. The faceless ghost invites projection. He takes on the identity of countless brothers, lovers, fathers, and sons. Throughout Whitman's war poetry and prose, the unknown soldier is an enduring figure of collective grief. Quote, unnamed, unknown, remain, and still remain the bravest soldiers. How can we mourn the dead when their very names are lost, when their bodies remain unburied? This is a central question of memoranda, specimen days, and drum taps, which the figure of the specimen attempts to reconcile. As a representative body capable of merging with others who died similar deaths in similar places, the specimen allows the act of mourning to be unbroken by the limits of selfhood and otherness, known and unknown. Within the corridors of the model room, Whitman soldiers exist as uncanny doubles, haunted by past and future specimens. Initially, they are framed by the cabinets of curiosities that decorated the galleries. Two years later, at Lincoln's second inaugural ball, Whitman saw the scene superimpose. The decadent revelers dance between unseen and uninvited guests, the ghosts of lost soldiers. Quote, tonight beautiful women, perfumes, the violin's sweetness, the polka and the waltz, then the amputation, the blue face, the groan, the glassy eye of the dying, the clotted rag, the odor of wounds and blood, and many a mother's son amid strangers passing away unattended there. These resurrected patients invade the present with phantasmal sensations. The ladies' perfumes are obscured by the odor of wounds and blood. The violin's sweetness is drowned out by the groans of the dying. The, inaugura the inauguration is superseded by the terrible beauty of the hospital, the bodies reflected in the model cases, their suffering rendering them somehow transcendent. Once again, these soldiers are anonymous, specters of those who died unattended, surrounded by strangers. As a hallucinatory ghost, this afterimage mirrors the phantom limb, a tactile illusion experienced by many Civil War amputees. While the afterimage functions as a visual trace of a trauma one continues to see, the phantom limb embodies the absence of an entity one continues to feel. Whitman's sensory haunting demonstrates the physicality of mourning. It is inscribed upon the body. The past returns as physical sensation, sight, smell, and sound. The poet's specimen ghosts surround and consume him. They are not confined to the interiority of the mind. After the patent office closed in March 1863, Whitman spent most of his time at Armory Square on the Mall. As he explained to his mother, quote, I devote much of myself to Armory Square Hospital because it contains by far the worst cases and has most suffering and most need of consolation. The following fragment invites the reader to see the wards through Whitman's eyes. Quote, enter with me this long ward, look down its rows of cots, with their occupants stretching away each side, with the wide open aisle in the middle. Every one of these cots has its history. Every case is a tragic poem, an epic, a romance, a pensive and absorbing book, if only it were written. Each case issues the invitation of an unwritten poem. Collectively, they form a pensive and absorbing book, a spectral text that exists as yet only in the mind of its author and the bodies of its subjects. This representation of the body in the bed as an absorbing book portrays Whitman's war texts as sites of incorporation for the unwritten histories and unburied bodies of soldiers. Whitman attests to the book's capacity for resurrection, the ability of words, however fragmented, to haunt. Memoranda during the war documents the psychosomatic aftermaths of trauma, the embodiment of mourning through the recurrent pain of, quote, old lingering wounds. Whitman seeks to salvage the casualties of war, to preserve the, quote, animal purity of their broken bodies. 
He gives voice to the, quote, pangs of aggravated wounds that ravage the bodies of his beloved specimens. Confederate and Union soldiers are sutured together, bound by the, quote, strange tie of mutual suffering. As democratic representatives, these specimens perform a synecdochic function. The whole union is represented by one of its parts. The genus is named for the species. The specimen embodies the hospitality of the stranger, an anonymous figure capable of absorbing the diversity of war casualties. Okay. Under the title, quote, Spiritual Characters Among the Soldiers, Whitman fuses an interest in scientific classification with an erotic form of observation. Quote, every now and then in hospital or camp, there are beings I meet, specimens of unworldliness, disinterestedness, and animal purity and heroism. The power of a strange spiritual sweetness. Something veiled and abstracted is often a part of the manners of these beings. They are often young men, obeying the events and occasions around them, unaware of their own nature, their companions only understanding that they are different from the rest, more silent, something odd about them. There is something already phantasmal, veiled and abstracted about these beings that haunts the poet in advance of their actual deaths. As an incarnation of spirituality, the specimen epitomizes the intimacy that passed between strangers in the hospital wards. Oddness is integral to the specimen's character, an uncanny articulation of queer specificities that render him unworldly. The specimen spirit not only resists mortality, his presence somehow transcends the world. The specimen thus offers a queer alternative to elaborate funerary traditions. His mourners do not require a body or even part of a body to situate their grief. Through textual preservation of this ephemeral body, infinite others can be absorbed. In his memoir, Brenton recalled the origins of his specimen collection and their alteration from, quote, human fragments into pathological artifacts. Quote, any account of the museum would be incomplete without some description of how the specimens passed from their original possessors to the museum. The bones of a part removed would be clean, partially cleaned and then with a wooden tag and carved number attached would be packed away in a keg containing alcohol sent to Washington and turned over to the Army Medical Museum, where preparations would be finished so they could take their place on the shelves. Brenton's approach to his specimens fundamentally differs from Whitman's in its absence of empathy and reciprocity. The curator appropriated human artifacts for the advancement of science, but their original possessor received little in return. While the museum is a landmark of medical history, Civil War soldiers who often unknowingly donated their bodies were, maybe, were not compensated for their sacrifice. Whitman, in contrast, lavished his soldiers with affection, letters, and small gifts. Before immortalizing them in memoranda, he kept vigil at their deathbeds and recorded their last words. Brenton's search for specimens led to many, quote, strange scenes of exhumation. One such case concerned the acquisition of, quote, a remarkable injury of the lower extremity. Brenton's efforts to secure the specimen were initially thwarted. Quote, the man had died with the limb on and had been carefully buried by his comrades who were determined to protect the corpse from disturbance. Brenton visited, quote, the messmates, explained my object, and dwelt upon the glory of a patriot having part of his body, at least, under special guard of his country. Brenton not only convinced the soldiers to agree to the disinterment, but to carry out the act themselves. Quote, the comrades of the dead soldier solemnly decided that I should have the bone for the good of the country, and in a body they marched out and dug up the body. He persuades the fallen soldier's comrades with the lure of unionist glory, a patriot giving up a part for the good of the country. This logic demonstrates the uncanny duality of military bodies. The soldiers form a patriotic body that exhumes a corporeal one. The specimen assumes a life of its own, independent of the vanishing agency of its original possessor. According to Brenton, quote, officers and soldiers who had lost a limb by amputation would often come to look upon its resting place. His memoir offers a glimpse into the trauma of a soldier examining his own specimen. Quote, a soldier, a private, came, examined the museum, and with the help of the assistant curator found his limb. It seemed to him his own property, and he demanded it noisily and pertinaciously. 
He was deaf to reason and was only silenced by the question of the curator, for how long did you enlist, for three years or the war? The answer, for the war. The curator responded, the United States government is entitled to all of you until the expiration of the specified time. I dare not give a part of you up before. Come then and you can have the rest, but not before. This soldier, this, his, his memoir is full of these stories. It's a really good read. Uh, the soldier resists the museum's doctrine of military possession, seeking to reclaim the limb as his own property. The curator insists that his enlistment mandates government ownership over his entire body, that the union retains whatever part is most useful, irrespective of the psychological cost to its original possessor. As soon as the museum was fairly established, Brenton wrote, it began to attract, sensation, it began to attract attention. Quote, the public came to see the bones, attracted by a new sensation. Given Whitman's fascination with war specimens, he may well have been among the throng of visitors. I recently discovered an undated draft fragment in the Harned Whitman collection, which I believe may be a response to the museum's collection. Come on. So this is the, the fragment which I'll quote from and hopefully we'll get back there momentarily. Quote, the mouldering bones and dry skeleton or parts of the skeleton are all that is presented as past history. But that is not past history. The past, the peoples of a hundred or a thousand or even ten or twenty thousand, yea, fifty thousand years ago, they too lived in blooming flesh with sparkling eyes and speaking lips. That's it. They too lived in blooming flesh with sparkling eyes and speaking lips new love, ambition, war, perhaps even science, the same as we do now. Thanks, Jason. This fragment captures Whitman's fascination with the instability of history. In Specimen Days, the poet insists that, quote, the real war will never get in the books, or in this case, onto the museum shelves. The dry bones of skeletons cannot capture the blooming flesh or sparkling eyes of human soldiers. Even poetry can only preserve a fragmentary glimpse of the terrible beauty these wounded men embodied. Another fragment from the Harned collection evokes the violent grandeur of the hospital's occupants. Quote, the profuse beauty of the young men's shining hair dampened with clots of blood. Skeletal remains from at least four of Whitman's soldiers became artifacts in the Army Medical Museum. Lenore Barbrian, Paul Sledzik, and Jeffrey Resnick, all former curators at the National Museum of Health and Medicine, recently published research identifying four specimens belonging to soldiers nursed by Whitman. All were submitted by Dr. D. Willard Bliss, chief surgeon at Armory Square, whom Whitman described as, quote, one of the best surgeons of the Army. Bliss praised Whitman for his devotion to soldiers. Quote, no one person who assisted during the war accomplished so much good to the soldier and for the government as Mr. Whitman. Did Whitman know the limbs of these soldiers were displayed in the museum? Did he visit them there? We may never know the answers to these questions, but we do know that their war narratives intersected on the bodies of these soldiers who were nursed by Whitman in life and curated by Brinton after death. Oscar Cunningham, who we may see in a moment, was wounded at Chancellorsville on May 2, 1863. A bullet was extracted from his right leg at Armory Square on June 15. Shortly after his arrival at hospital, Whitman observed, quote, I thought he ought to have been taken to a sculptor to model for an emblematic figure of the West. He was such a handsome young giant. There he is. Um, he was such a handsome young giant over six feet high. Cunningham's wound festered, necessitating amputation at the thigh on May 2nd, 1864. Whitman mourned the deterioration of his, quote, youthful physical manliness. Quote, I have just left Oscar Cunningham in a dying condition. It would draw a tear from the hardest heart to look at him, all wasted away to a skeleton. You remember I told you a year ago when he was first brought in, I thought him the noblest specimen of a young Western man I had seen. Oh, what a change. Cunningham was still alive on May 5th when Bliss submitted his specimen to the museum. Surviving records do not indicate whether or not he was aware that his limb was donated. 
Although Bliss's letter suggests that he held out hope for his patient's recovery, Cunningham died on June 5, 1864. He became specimen number 2254 in the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. His bone is currently on display at the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Whitman memorialized Oscar Wilbur under the heading A New York Soldier in Memoranda During the War. Wilbur sustained a fracture of the femur at the Battle of Chancellorsville on May 3, 1863. He lay unattended on the battlefield for 10 days before finally being evacuated to Aquia Creek Hospital. He remained there for 42 days before being transferred to Armory Square on June 14. According to Bliss's reports, he suffered from constant nausea and died of exhaustion July 31st. Whitman remembered him as a stoic, spiritual young man who reciprocated the poet's affections. Quote, I have spent a long time with Oscar F. Wilbur, low with chronic diarrhea and a bad wound. He talked of death and said he did not fear it. I said, why Oscar, don't you think he will get well? He said, I may, but it is not probable. He behaved very manly and affectionate. The kiss I gave him as I was about leaving, he returned fourfold. Bliss submitted Wilbur's femur to the museum sometime after his death. The bone was most likely removed posthumously for the purpose of contribution to the museum, where Wilbur became surgical specimen 1534. Whitman's most medically famous specimen was John Mahay, who was shot in the groin at the Second Battle of Bull Run on August 29, 1862. He was treated at Armory Square, where Brenton visited him. The curator wrote a detailed account of Mahay's unusual wound and symptoms, including the passage of bone fragments through his urethra. Mahay died on October 24, 1862. During the autopsy, several urinary stones were removed from his bladder and catalogued as surgical specimen 2567. Whitman remembered the tragic details of Mahay's life and death in memoranda. Quote, poor John Mahay is dead. His was a painful and lingering case, shot through the lower region of the abdomen, the bladder perforated by a bullet going straight through him. Poor Mahay, a mere boy in age, but old in misfortune, never knew the love of parents, was placed in his infant infancy in one of New York's charitable institutions and bound out to a tyrannical master, the scars of whose cowhide and club yet remained on his back. He found friends in hospital life and indeed was a universal favorite. He had quite a funeral ceremony. After enduring years of abuse, according to Whitman, Mahay found friends in the hospital. Posthumously, he attained medical notoriety. Unlike Whitman's other specimens who were relegated to mere statistics, Mahay's unusual wound earned a detailed description in the medical and surgical history, including graphic illustrations. Frank Irwin was shot in the left knee during the Battle of Fort Fisher on March 25, 1865. He was transferred to Armory Square, where Bliss amputated his leg on April 14. Irwin died May 2, 1865, the result of a pimea infection. Assistant Surgeon M.J. Munger submitted his femur to the museum on April 16, while Irwin was still alive. He was assigned surgical specimen 4077. As with Cunningham, there is no evidence to indicate whether Irwin gave consent or, were even, or was even aware of his limb's donation. Whitman often composed expressions of condolence following soldiers' deaths. He included this letter to Irwin's mother in memoranda. Quote, I do not know of his past life, but I feel it must have been good. What I saw of him here, under the most trying circumstances, with a painful wound among strangers, I can say he behaved so brave, so composed, so sweet and affectionate, it could not be surpassed. I thought perhaps a few words, though from a stranger, about your son, from one who was with him at the last, might be worthwhile, for I love the young man, though I but saw him immediately to lose him. Whitman's deathbed vigils demonstrate the capacity of strangers to form a binding intimacy with the dying, to mourn their passing even in the absence of personal history. The neglected symbol of the specimen in Whitman's writing reveals volumes about the intimacy of mourning strangers in 19th century America. Moving beyond a necrophilic attachment to the corpse, the specimen recalls the allure of the phantom limb, an entity felt most acutely in its vacancy. As a signifier of embodied mourning, it traces connections that remain impossible to sever. <laughs> 
Whitman and Brinton offer convergent histories of the war's strange cases and dual bodies, military and corporeal, phantom and physical. Brinton's specimens are components of an army that is reconstructed within the museum to demonstrate the coherence of the Union. Whitman insists upon the continued relevance of absent bodies and their abandoned parts. His specimens are textually entombed in honor of all those that eluded burial. In contrast, Brinton's specimens are perpetually unburied, preserved behind glass cases. Yet both the poetic and surgical narratives insist that the Union endures in spite of its wounds. The sutured democracy absorbs its rejected members. In Whitman's famous words, it contains multitudes. While Brinton was attached to the materiality of his skeletal remains, he was clinically detached from the living bodies they originated from. When Whitman writes of a specimen, he articulates a physical, psychological, and often sexual connection to another human being. For Whitman, the body is more than the sum total of its parts, and the human fragment is therefore more than the subtraction of its original whole. The body is the soul, and thus the amputated limb retains a trace of the spirit that inhabited the living body intact. The museum's shelves and books pages display carefully preserved afterlives of science and spirit. Brinton insisted that the museum was not merely a cabinet for war curiosities, but a national scientific inheritance. Quote, the foundation of a great medical museum was not for the collection of curiosities, but the accumulation of data of lasting scientific interest. The lingering influence of these preserved limbs upon survivors and scientists frames the aftermath of amputation as a form of haunting that besets not only amputees, but also their carers, doctors, collectors, and voyeurs. These lost members possess their own afterlives, independent of the bodies they left behind. Thank you. questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. We have time for a few questions. Does anyone have any? One right there. Thank you. Um, I'm curious to hear uh, you elaborate a little bit more on the phantom limb. You mentioned the spies and how it mirrors um, the, the component that you're talking about. Well, that's a fantastic question because it takes me into the next chapter, um, which is um, about Whitman and another sort of strange surgical figure of the Civil War, Silas Weir Mitchell, a Philadelphia neurologist who was the first person to coin the phrase phantom limb. And strangely, even though um, Mitchell was, became very famous for his neurological investigations on amputee soldiers, um, his first publication of Instance of Phantom Lamb was actually a fictional ghost story called The Case of George Dedlow. And George Dedlow loses all of his arms in the war. Um, he's a quadruple amputee. He's also a doctor. So he kind of interrogates his own experience through a sort of medical ghost story narrative. And as each limb is taken, he feels that he loses more and more of his sense of, of identity, of the soul. So we're going back to that idea that the human fragment retains some kind of trace, uh, maybe a cellular memory of the soul that inhabited it. In the end of the story, Dedlow goes to a spiritualist seance, and he thinks, oh, this is kind of bollocks. I'm not really believing in it. But his, his legs arrive by spirit wrapping their specimen numbers in the Army Medical Museum. So Weir Mitchell also intersects, and it's just the most great, fantastic thing for me anyway. Um, it's so hilarious, and, and it's a really unusual thing in, in terms of Weir Mitchell's narrative. People are really confused as to whether this was a joke or why he wrote it. Um, you'll have to read the book to find out what I think. But the other interesting thing about Mitchell is that he becomes Whitman's personal physician after the war. So while Whitman is writing about phantoms of countless lost soldiers and the ashes of soldiers and about embalming soldiers within leaves of grass, he's being treated by Weir Mitchell. And Weir Mitchell, of course, lives in Philadelphia. He and Brinton are both members of the College of Physicians, and he writes the introduction to Brinton's memoir. So um, all of these characters intersect, and I think their work intersects in a really interesting way. 
success list, please do sign up if you want to learn about future events. We have a sign up list over there behind on the table. And you can also sign up on our website. Any further questions in the back? Hi. How is Whitman's handwriting? Well, if I can get back to it, you can see a sample. Oh, it may not happen. Look, when he's doing a final draft of something, it's really incredibly beautiful, and I find it very legible, but I've been looking at it for quite some time now. Um, he drafts and redrafts really compulsively, and he often writes in pencil. So when he's writing in pencil and he's scratching over things and marking over things that may have gotten quite smudged, it can be really tricky. But um, compared to Brenton, his handwriting is a dream. Um, I'm interested in what got you interested in this really odd <laughs> Well, um, I'll give you the personal version first. I guess I, I grew up in Kentucky and Alabama, and, and I used to find bullets digging in the dirt. Um, uh, in the, in the woods behind our house. So I think when you grow up in places where these battlefields were, you kind of inherit a sense of their significance. Um, I started out my dissertation looking at um, how understand, contemporary understandings of ecology and environmental science has influenced Whitman's changing ways of mourning the dead and leaves of grass. So it started out kind of being almost an eco-critical reading of Whitman, and that changed really quickly um, as I stumbled on stories like this one and intersections like this one. I first read of Brenton in a book by Gary Laterman called The Sacred Remains, and there were some of these funny quotes in that book that appear here, and I was reading these quotes and thinking, I have to know who this guy was. And so that's how I found him. Have the fragments of these four soldiers that Whitman knew personally ever been displayed together with a Whitman connection spelled out? And they certainly should be when your book comes out. <laughs> Well, that would be a fantastic idea. Eric Boyle, take note. <laughs> they ha I know that they have, they are actually on part of a digital exhibit, which is on the National Museum of Health and Medicine website. So I'm really glad you asked that question so that I can encourage you all to go there and look at them. And some of Whitman's writings about them are there. And I'll, I'll mention again how indebted I am to the scholarship of the curators, Jeffrey Resnick, uh, Barbarian, I always mess up her name, um, and Sledzik, who I had been working on this Whitman and Brenton connection for about three years, and in January of this year, their article was published from their time at the National Museum, and they had read a book by Roy Morris Jr. about Whitman during the Civil War, and they were then inspired to search the museum and find if any of Whitman's specimens had been, um, had, had found their way to the museum, and they indeed had. <laughs> that would be um, a wonderful thing. I hope to do so. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. We have time for one or two more. Hi. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I'm just curious if you can comment on the United States colored troops. Were they also on display in, in, the, in the museum? Did Whitman develop any engagement with colored troops or their remains? Mm -hmm. How did that figure into this uh, the story you described? That is a fascinating question and one that I'm really, really eager to explore further. I'm not aware, of my, my investigation into the museum specimens at this point is only limited to those four, so I'm afraid I can't answer, but Eric Boyle um, from the National Museum is here and, and might have some more information and their website is excellent. One of the things I have, and, and that tantalizing photograph and deeply troubling photograph alludes to, discovered is um, the prevalence of the colored troops with, with the reburial campaign and with the burial of the dead. So um, one of the things I'm interested in looking at as this chapter moves forward is how the colored troops or um, African American servants were appropriated and forced to transport these human remains and what that work would have been like for them. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that kind of links to um, some material that I work on in the first chapter around um, the bodies of African Americans, Native Americans, and recent immigrants who were 
most often used for anatomical dissection against their will. So we have all these questions of consent and marginal bodies and how medical science in the 19th century and even still today owes a huge debt to the bodies of people who either did not consent or were not capable of consenting to what happened to their bodies posthumously. So it's a really fascinating question and one that I'm only beginning to, to understand. Thank you. One more. The good thing, I, I came later, I was wondering if Whitman commented on the, the, the European tradition of body parts of saints and things like that. Is that something that was in his consciousness? I wonder, if, I, I wonder indeed if it was in his consciousness when he wrote that fragment, um, the little moldering bones fragment that I found in the Harned collection. Um, and in the article um, by Jeffrey Resnick and colleagues um, about these four specimens, one of the things they talk about is, you know, the tradition of displaying relics of saints and how, in a way, the ways in which the, the specimens were displayed at the Army Medical Museum was in keeping with that kind of religious iconography. Um, often gold threads were used to hang them. You know, they were displayed in a very artful way. Um, so I think there is very much a legacy of that religious iconography in how the museum was arranged artistically. And it, it tends to be, you know, one of its first um, homes was the Conqueron Building, which was an art gallery. So there's very much a link between aesthetics and science in these spaces. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.